thanks for joining us again for another one of our CEA Google Hangouts, uh, where we've been discussing the intersection of art and innovation. Uh, in recent discussions, we've talked about streamed services and how they may, in fact, be a salvation for the music industry. Our last discussion was with musician Jamie Saft, where he talked about how technology has made it not only possible, but preferable for him to create his own record label. Uh, I've certainly been writing about and, and obsessed with uh, the tech industry as it relates to the creation of art, uh, both as an observer and a participant. Uh, and my scrutiny of the industry led me to believe that it made sense to go the independent route. Uh, and this past September, we see in the publication of my first book, which is now available on Amazon. Um, today, I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Nash, who is featured in the current issue of Poets and Writers magazine, and he's correctly identified as the Indie Oracle. Um, Richard has been named by the Utney Reader as one of 50 visionaries changing the world, and Mashable.com picked him as the number one Twitter user changing the shape of publishing. So Richard, a warm welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. Why don't you walk us through a little bit of the trajectory? I know you, I know you've led a very interesting life and, and, and led a creative path the last decade. Maybe walk us through um, you know, what you're doing now, where you've come from, and, and why, in essence, disruption, which is the new buzzword, is a very good thing for technology. Uh, yeah, so I, <clears throat> I mean, originally, straight out of college, I was a theater director and spent the best part of a decade uh, working in the sort of avant-garde theater and performance uh, scene uh, in downtown Manhattan um, and uh, segued from that in a, in a very odd horizontal way into publishing. Um, many people who seem to end up in publishing end up in it somewhat by accident. Um, I think in part it's because the sort of thing that you can't actually study um, you just end up in it and you just have to start problem solving. Uh, and in a certain sense, all publishing is, is a solution to a problem. It varies as to what that problem is, uh, but uh, while, while it may seem that publishing is, sol is suffering from problems, really all publishing is is an act of solving problems. And what that, what's that problem, that solved problem can be uh, how to distribute information, uh, how to tell a story, um, how to help fix something, uh, how to advocate for a new way of doing things. Um, and so I just ended up inside an independent publisher called Soft Skull Press uh, starting 2000-2001 and ended up running it for the best part of that decade. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll talk a little bit later I expect about some of my experiences there and what I learned um, but what I will say in, in brief is that what, what Soft Skull represents with hindsight what it represents is the first moment when uh, cultures started shifting from being something that was scarce to something that was abundant um, there was a moment in culture making that wasn't quite as visible as the internet has made it but was nevertheless significant over the course of the 80s and the 90s which is that the barriers to entry started falling they didn't fall to zero like they are now in many ways but they fell dramatically and so first in music with the advent of, of, of thousands of tiny indie record labels and then zines, magazines, and, and book publishing, you know, being driven by the power of desktop publishing, and then email and web 1.0, uh, and the profusion of, of, of superstores, retailers that needed a lot of product, um, there was a dramatic increase in the number of books uh, published over the course of the, of the 90s, and, and my press sort of exemplified that. It, it started in a Kinko's. Um, so, uh, but times change and it was certainly clear that by 2009 things were changing a lot more faster than a lot of the infrastructures of legacy publishing were, were, were um, changing faster than they were changing and so I kind of wanted to 
try to leap forward a little bit. So I launched a startup called Cursor that was aimed at creating a platform um, that would help traditional independent book publishers become much more community-based in how they approach things and conversely helped existing web content places, not the massive ones like Huffington Post, but the nichier content ones to actually um, make money by selling print books. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, that was successful in some ways as an experiment, but it wasn't successful from a from a sort of a getting a, a funded and and getting um, uh, it up to the next level. So I joined another startup called uh, Small Demons, uh, and this is basically a data startup that focused on data inside books, uh, identifying all the people, places, music, movies, food, drink, events, brands in a in in books, and connected them all up together so that it became a kind of a semantic web for the inside of books and the inside of a lot of different cultural uh, 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 artifacts. Um, that did get funded, although unfortunately uh, the, our funding has, has, has been running dry, so I may be moving on to, uh, to other gigs in the not-too-distant future, but upshot is that I've been... Um, uh, very active in a lot of quite um, ambitious uh, 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 startups. The more ambitious they are, the likelier it is that they'll fail from an economic standpoint. But um, but the more likely it is that they'll have influence over what other startups and other large companies will do going forward. So so that's me, more or less, in a nutshell. So you you I mean it's you've definitely seen, and I think for the benefit of our our maybe our younger audience. We've said this before, but it's important to kind of contextualize the history of where we are in this moment by observing the fact that the publishing industry, to a certain extent, was largely unchanged for, for centuries. So the, the sea change that the Internet brought, which, as we have to acknowledge, the Internet changed everything uh, in, in so many ways, um, we're now at a, at a point where I think where you are, and maybe some of our, our viewers and, and a lot of people I talk to aren't quite there yet, is the notion, and maybe we can do a little lifting in the service of debunking the uh, the, the notion of legitimacy. So with this new agency that exists, I think there's still an issue that we need to get past. We're, we're past it, I think, on the inside, but the larger culture is gradually changing. I've just found it curious that we don't have this issue, it seems, with family vineyards or craft brewers. Right. Um, you know, if, if you're not sponsored by Anheuser-Busch, your beer is not seen as an inferior product. Yeah. In fact, in many regards, it's seen as a better product. I think that that's something that you can elaborate on in terms of yeah. it's obvious what's happened, but where are we and, and what are some of the things that you actually see technology doing to yeah. both debunk the nonsense, but also really not only empower writers, right, but empower readers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean... You know, publishing is it, it was the very first culture industry. In some ways, it could be called even the very first industry uh, in the sense in which we now understand it, the mass production um, of objects. And so it benefited from an incredibly early start, uh, centuries of user experience, uh, centuries of... Um, of uh, sustaining innovation, um, uh, new formats, tweaks to new formats, uh, um, benefiting from, you know, Penguin. Penguin invented the vending machine uh, to sell books in, in in train stations in the 1920s. So, um, so it 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 has had a sort of a tremendous. Um, history of sustaining uh, 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 innovation which often can make it um, somewhat complacent uh, and also sort of makes it allows it to feel like um, we've never changed and that the way things are right now is the way that things should be um, and 
one particular aspect of things that fall into the way things are now and therefore they should be uh, is that there is a um, that there is a a quality control aspect around the selection process. Mm -hmm. Now, publishers do provide a lot of quality control in the product development sense. Ed uh, a development editorial, um, meaning, uh, you know, move this chapter here, um, this character feels a little underdeveloped, um, a, a, your analysis doesn't flow from this chapter to the next chapter very well, or copy editing, improving your style, or proofreading, fixing sure. a comma that went in the wrong place. Um, it has, you know, work around how the product is packaged, around cover design. There's, you know, there's a lot of, of, of quality assurance uh, style work that 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 gets bundled up inside the publisher function overall uh, that is tremendously valuable, but selection uh, was always treated as being way more important than it has actually turned out to be. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there was basically a problem in publishing where because they selected books and those were the only books that were ever published were the ones that they selected, people looked at the books published and said, oh, God, there's some very good books here. That must mean that we're doing a great job selecting them. But if you actually dig a little deeper, you discover that so many books came this close away from never being published. Walt sure. Whitman self-published Leaves of Grass. Uh, uh, Melville pretty much disappeared for a hundred years. Kafka was almost invisible for for most of um, uh, his professional life. Um, we have all kinds of stories in more contemporary publishing around some writer who published in the 60s, disappeared for 30 years, and is then rediscovered. And we treat our rediscovery as if it is proof that we're so fantastic. But right. actually, the rediscovery is proof that we often actually suck <laughs> at, well, that, at that, the, the, at the that selection story, process. You know, Elmore Leonard is, is, a, is a great contemporary example. I, I didn't know that, I guess, his first novel was rejected by 80 publishers. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I kept publishing books. Well, so there's been rejected by all these publishers, and they did well. And so I thought, oh, I'm so good. <laughs> and then I started noticing these books I had rejected being done by other independent publishers doing really well. And I was like, I guess I'm an asshole. And well, what it and I, yeah, I think, well, you certainly we, we've already kind of seen it shake out in the music industry. And I think the, the publishing industry, to its credit, um, has learned some of those lessons. I think what you've tapped into, what I've really gotten from a lot of the things you've talked about, is really harnessing, you know, the crowd-based curation. Yeah. Yeah. That that the only people that are barking the loudest, as is expected and typical, are the traditional gatekeepers and tastemakers. And now, making it a more democratized uh, event really benefits the readers and the authors. The only people it stands to not benefit are the people that controlled the process and the mechanism of distribution before. Yeah. I mean, the 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 to the extent that there are people out there who are. Um, providing services to, uh, to authors, they're generating very significant value. And there are definitely people out there who are creating useful clusters on behalf of readers. Um, but, but it's more that they are finding ways to create... Um, little taste clusters on behalf of the reader as opposed to I am telling the reader what to read. Um, nobody wants to be told uh, 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 what to read or for that matter even listen to, especially what not to read because that's 15 hours of one person's voice whispering in your ear while you can't do anything else. Right. So that's a real, there's a huge emotional commitment from a reader to a writer. Um, you can walk away from it, but you spend three hours trying to pick up on the plot and the ascertain the motivations and the 
uh, uh, voice of the various characters, and you know that that's a that's a real commitment to make. So um, the 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 um, the mere fact of it, it, it's almost like um, you know it, it, the gatekeeper when it's just a person who says I'm just going to admit who I like. Let's let's say we're talking about a bouncer outside a nightclub. Right. If the bouncer is only letting in people he or she likes, then you know it's it's a boring party. But if it's the only party in town, you're going to have to go. Right. But in a world where there's thousands and thousands of nightclubs, the role of the bouncer is more to create an interesting party inside, uh, and that involves being able to sort of like look at the crowd in front of you, and be able to ascertain well what are all these you know what are these folks looking to? How can I listen in interesting ways to all the people clustered in front of the door so that the folks who get to come in are, are, are the interesting ones? So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's using, finding creative ways to use the crowd is now the key aspect. And I think, you know, when, when I say that to people, they're like, oh my God, it's going to be American Idol for books. <laughs> And I'm like, you know, you actually misunderstand something about American Idol. The important thing about American Idol is not about picking the winner. Mm -hmm. It's about watching the process. Sure. American Idol generates far more money selling ads to the process of picking the winner than it makes off the band or the singer at the end who wins and they now have the rights to tour that person or record that person. There's much more money in the process. And so what that suggests to me is that the, the community engagement is where the value gets created. Letting people participate uh, is where the value uh, is created. And the the winner picking aspect of things ultimately just isn't as big a part of human life as um, you know. Winner picking is is I mean obviously we all like to pick winners, but we all like to win the lottery. You know, if if we if we made our living buying lottery tickets, you know, we sure. we 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 would be we would be we would be dead broke. Um, so. A, 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 the more the more you can pull in the community um, to to participate in the process of making meaning um, taste making together uh, taste recognition almost uh, the better uh, situation we'll all be in I, I agree and I think uh, it's actually maybe an unintentional unintentionally very apt metaphor about the lottery I don't think it's terribly cynical to suggest that in the old model, more the 20th century model, the, the flavor of the month, however warranted, was the anointed book that a publisher under, necessarily was going to market with. So in a sense, they won the lottery at the expense of a lot of other authors who may have warranted yeah. an audience. Now, yeah. it's not a zero-sum game, and it really should never have been. The music industry figured this out. The movie yeah. industry is, is very slow in figuring this out. That it, the 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 more people that are getting exposure, the more vibrant the community, the more material is out there, the more healthy the industry. Which I think does circle back to the idea that really, who who stands to lose here? And it's the people with the purse strings or or the ostensible purse strings. Everyone else, yeah. the audience and the artists, all benefit from this scenario. Yeah, I mean, and I think you know, I've I've started getting some more visibility into the cable industry recently because my wife works in the cable business, and you've I've started to sort of see there the you know much broader diversity in the amount of television that is that is getting created. Um, uh, yeah, a combination of new cost structures, obviously to some degree, uh, but also combinations of of ways in which um, uh, of ways in which um, the an audience that once upon a time just wouldn't have been viable um, 
because the only way you monetized an audience was through ads becomes viable when one of the ways in which you monetize the audience is they pay $9.99 a month whether it's for Netflix or HBO or $20 for some stars HBO you know uh, a combo that 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 when that, that that intensity of engagement becomes something that is relevant um, in in the advertising world and, and certainly in the world of Nielsen ratings uh, every eyeball is the same <laughs> right and and uh, you know they can't measure whether you just watched the show versus if you like dress up at home like one of the characters from the show <laughs> like in the world of, of anime manga and cosplay you know mm -hmm. and so there that level of, of of intensity there's now more ways to sort of uh, for the industry to reflect different degrees of intensity and create business models that help capture that so that businesses can better to use the term exploit people but on the other hand because they can they're also able to create a richer range of experiences that people actually want so the net effect is more diversity of content more artists being able to create different kinds of things um, and and it, it, it's probably richest in the world of music, uh, you know, getting slow maybe in the world of, of, of cable and, and books, you know, in their own ad hoc way will get there eventually. <laughs> well, and, and I think my favorite quote that I've read from you, and then there are many I could pick from, but you, you, you pointed out that Amazon, at the end of the day, for, for all the good they and, and what they represent are doing, they're still a retailer. They're not a publisher. Yeah. And I think what you've... They're what a vending heard, machine. Sure. And, and, and so in the, it, it kind of takes you halfway there. I think another quote, well, I know another quote that I've loved that, that you said was, um, the self-publishing is, is not the ending but the beginning. It's an invitation to the party, but we need an MC to host the Yeah. Party. Yeah. And, I mean, in the end, you know, part of the mistake that we made back when when publishing all was in the form that we've known it up until recently, one of the mistakes that authors made, and it was understandable why they made it, I think we all made it, was assuming that being published was the goal. Right, sure. Um, because since there weren't very many people published, just by being published you were going to get attention. Right. Um, so being published was equated to obtaining attention. But by the 90s and certainly by now being published, you know, I mean I would, you know, I would give an author a contract back in my soft skull days and they'd be thrilled and I'd I'd edit the book and hopefully they would remain thrilled and they would see the PDF of how it was going to look and they would be thrilled and they would see the cover and they were delighted and I would give them the first copy of the book and they'd be <laughs> over the moon and they'd go into the bookstore they they they'd stand there admiring their book in the bookstore and just be like this is what I always wanted, and then a second or two happens and they look around, and there's fifty thousand other books right in that store, and there are eight people in that store, <laughs> and they realized holy this is not actually what I wanted what I wanted was those eight people over there looking at my book and so and so in a certain sense as, as you say publishing is now just the beginning of an adventure of of engaging with your world um, rather than the culmination uh, of an adventure yeah and I think it, it as always it, it's a little bit facile but you go back to the future and it's fascinating to me how there's there's still some resistance which I think is a little bit snobby about the idea of being able to look inside a book or having recommendations made. But what bookstores were arguably the first, maybe other than car dealerships, but bookstores 
allowed you to pick up copies of the books or magazines and read them. Yes. Um, what that was lacking was the librarian or the manager of the store to come over and say, what authors do you like? Yeah. I just think this is an accelerated way to democratize the idea that, that for people that are interested, and a lot of readers are, and in fact, I think the readership is growing now, and statistics prove that, um, it's, not, it's not being told what to read. It's being told what you might like to read, and that yeah. is a bit empowering. Yeah, it's 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 um, offering people, and this is, I mean, I, I sort of feel that the the future of the retailing slash, because in, 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 as you know, with sort of streaming stuff, are you really retailing content there? I mean, retail. Is suggestive of a unit of something. So let's say you know some combination of those entities that are selling units of culture, uh, plus those entities that are offering you the smorgasbord, um, but are immensely aware that if all they offer is the smorgasbord, you're going to cancel your subscription sure. because. Uh, um, you know, if you walk, if you're overpowered by selection, sometimes you just leave. So, so the 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 future of the consumption side or the business side of how culture is consumed has 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 a lot to do with being able to provide certain kinds of guidance, certain kinds of nudges. Um, certain kinds of little maps, little condensations, little clusters. The metaphors are, uh, you know, there's many of them, and I don't think there's anyone out there who, who has solved it, and there won't be, there won't be a single solution. It'll be, it'll be a range of solutions. Sure. But it will, it will come from that. So it's not going to be dictatorial. Um, a, a, I think... You know, the people who bought also bought is a signal, but there will be many other signals. Yes. Um, and 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 it is about it really is going to have to be about empowering the consumer because the tendency of a lot of these tools is to is to be selling discovery to the producers. Mm -hmm. uh, um, because the producers are like, how do I get people to see my stuff? So right. startups and my own small demon startup included, we can tend sometimes to go to publishers and say we have a discovery solution. But the reality is that it's only publishers and producers that have a quote unquote discovery problem. Um, a, consumers have a different kind of a problem, which I think says as some takes some kind of. Uh, uh, sense of like it, it, it's the aimless channel surfing thing. It's the feeling like there's stuff out there and I'm kind of paying attention to it, but it's not very satisfying. I want to feel like I am in show. I am the captain of my own content consumption speedboat or yacht. And, and we haven't gotten to where we haven't gotten there in terms of giving consumers that feeling, but that's where we have to get to. And I think that we're inexorably headed there. To, you know, the the future won't wait for these developments that have already that are already in process. I think, really, what it boils down to is it's the same as it ever was in the sense that publishing, self-publishing, has definitely enabled anyone to do it, yeah. um, and and that audience will find itself to a certain extent. I think the larger problem is and always has been when you have profit-driven agendas in the picture, that's what's cluttering the airwaves and the markets with derivative crap that, that people feel unsatisfied. Yeah. You know, the the that... B2 problem, you know, unfortunately isn't going, you know, I don't know how to get around that. Uh, other than that, it seems like the rate at which, I mean, you certainly see in the movie business a continued focus on tentpole properties that have, you know, at least three, if not six, sequels. Sure. Um, and, you know, 
but the the flip side of that is the great serial. You know, it's Game of Thrones versus Die Hard Seven. Right. Um, and and I would be. I I think we're seeing more value created by these serials, or more. I, I'm not enough of an expert to, to be confident, but I'm going to throw out there, you know, as being more of a layperson in the world of 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 of, of, of TV and film, that that it seems anecdotally as if the serial may at least take some of the of the of the empty calories <laughs> of the sequel away yes. from the equation because. Typically, the, the sequel is just the laziest form of, of taste analysis. They First like time. this, so we'll give them this again, um, rather, than, rather than taking a sort of like a deeper dive into the culture and into human creativity. And so, a, you know, there are, there are always going to be memes. There's always going to be Fifty Shades of Grey. There's always going to be Gangnam Style, but I think those things will probably, I think, kind of race through the culture, yes, blow through all their fuel, and finish, hopefully more quickly, and not, and and be what they are, which is sort of what they are for that moment, and not generate this sort of like awful um, set of Me Too things. That then have to get flushed out of the cultural system, uh, uh, sort of diarrhea style. <laughs> well, sure, and, and and I think I think the good news and and where we are now, I think you and I would agree that more choices is a good thing. More avenues of distribution and exploration is a good thing. Yeah, I think the the right now we are living in a moment where the future is being written every day. Things are changing daily. I guess for for today, uh, it's to be continued, and perhaps okay. when when we chat again, which I would look forward to, you know, whether it's a few months or a year from now, we'll see what you've been doing and and what the culture has been deciding is sure. effective, and what what ways are we, you know, curating content and and giving the opportunity back to the content creators and consumers as opposed to people outside the system that control the purse strings. Excellent. I look forward to it. Great. Well, thanks for being with us. Uh, and yeah, again, to be continued as far as I'm concerned.